The Gospel of the Lord is from cha Luke chapter 1. Can we please stand for the Gospel? At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she explained, exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and, is, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord will fulfil her promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my Saviour. For he has been faithful of the humble state of his ser servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be faithful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. One of the astounding things about the way that God works in the world is that he uses ordinary people to do his extraordinary things. God's action in the world sometimes is so gentle, so natural, that it looks like a meeting between two women, two relatives. In this meeting of Elizabeth and Mary, we have a beautiful picture of the life of believers and how God works among us. I think we're supposed to take these women as examples of what it is to live in faith. The background to the story is the angel had spoken to Zechariah and said that his, his wife, who was believed to be barren, would, would have a child. And Elizabeth then went into seclusion for five months, but in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel then appeared to Mary and told Mary that she would have a child by the Holy Spirit. Our text continues then, at that time, at that time, so Mary's just heard about the angel, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. It's a wonderful thing in our Christian walk when we have people we can go to for support. Mary, in a situation which nobody else is going to understand, goes to meet with Elizabeth. Mary is no doubt at this point busting with joy, she's busting with questions, she's perhaps even well aware of the, the knowledge of the scandal that her pregnancy is going to cause and that nobody's going to believe her story of how it happened. Now we don't know much about the relationship between these two women, but we do know that it is such that when Mary has this amazing experience, she hurries to get there. As she struggles to process what's going on in her life and what God has called her to do, she knows who to turn to. It's a beautiful picture of the companionship that can be found amongst those who share faith in God. As we reflect on what this meeting might mean for them, perhaps we also reflect on what it might mean for us. One of the things I think it means is that uh, perhaps Older people need to stay open to the surprising things that God is doing in the lives of younger people. Sometimes it's tempting, you know, we, we've been there, we've done that. You know, we know how God worked for us and so we know how God works in the world. And so Elizabeth has had this amazing experience herself. But she's about to discover in Mary that God has something even more amazing uh, going on there for Mary. And we can reflect on the fact that younger people sometimes need the support of somebody who's walked with God, who's actually taken this journey ahead of them, to help them stay firm in his ways and to help them navigate this journey that God has set them on. Elizabeth is, is a much older woman than Mary, and yet across those generations she's able to be there as a support and a guide for Mary as Mary deals with something that nobody else in the history of humanity has had to deal with. 
As Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaps for joy. The angel had said that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. And here is the fulfilment of that, as now the Holy Spirit moves in the unborn child to begin his role of welcoming the Messiah. But he can't now speak for himself. He can leap for joy, but if it's to come out in words now, it comes now as the Holy Spirit rests on his mother Elizabeth and she gives voice to her son's joy in announcing the Messiah. The word of God comes through this older woman. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child that you will bear. But she says, why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What a wonderful role it is for this older woman to speak to the next generation and tell them that they have the favour and the blessing of God. Elizabeth, by the Holy Spirit, announces God's favour to confirm in Mary her acceptance of what the angel had said. Mary, no doubt, has questions, but here her loving and her faithful friend also discerns God's work in her life and speaks that work in her life so that she can celebrate. And we can do that for one another. If we listen carefully with the ears of the Spirit, then as we look at the lives of each other, then it won't be a baby that leaps inside us, but there will be something that leaps inside us that, that tells us the things that we need to affirm about how God is working in the life of the people around us. Elizabeth also announces this blessing of the child that Mary bears, and then greets Mary as the mother of my Lord. By the power of the Holy Spirit, again, Elizabeth recognises who Jesus will be. At the very least, her greeting shows that she's understood that Jesus will be the Messiah, and I think we're probably meant to understand here, my Lord, in actually the, the full theological sense of recognising that this is God here. And this is the first time in any of the Gospels, I mean, at this stage, Mary probably doesn't even really know whether she's pregnant. Like, she believes the angel, but is, is this the thing that's going to happen now? And, and Elizabeth names it. Mary is at this moment the mother of the Lord. And so Elizabeth is the one who for the first time proclaims Jesus as Lord to the, to the world. How lovely it is, though, when we do that same thing. When we look at each other and point to where Jesus is in our lives and celebrate that. And Elizabeth does it with such a, an astonishing hum humility and joy. There is a bad part of me. And I love to hear other preachers praised, but I also kind of don't. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, usually the reaction it causes in me is, I wish I was good like them. But there doesn't seem to be any of that in what Elizabeth has to say here. Elizabeth is, is free of that. There's no sign of jealousy. I mean, she's been given this amazing role of being the, the mother of the forerunner of the Messiah, and now she meets the mother of the Messiah. And there's no sense of, oh, I wish I'd had that role. There's just this amazing joy in what God is doing in the life of Mary. Elizabeth is humble and she is satisfied in the role of what God has given her to do. Was it perhaps from Elizabeth that John the Baptist learnt the kind of character that made him suitable for his role? Remember that John said about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. And in fact, even as John does that, he actually reaches the height of the glory that's been given to him. Jesus says to John the Baptist that there is no one born of woman who is greater in the kingdom than John the Baptist. His, but his greatness consists in the fact that he puts himself aside to give glory to what God is doing in Jesus and to be a servant. And that's an attitude that he probably learnt from his mother Elizabeth who does precisely that at this moment. And that attitude of rejoicing in God's work wherever she sees it helps Elizabeth to be joyful. She rejoices in the fact that she also now gets to be a part of what God is doing through Mary. At times we do look on others and we wish that maybe we had their role in the kingdom of God. But God calls us to be satisfied with what he has given us to do. But perhaps we can also join in supporting other people in their callings. 
when we are happy to see God's plans unfold, even with his presence with other people, then we will know ourselves to be blessed and favoured. There's a real joy in being able to see what God is doing in other people. And there's a real joy in being able to go, well, if that's what God is doing in you, let me support you in that. I don't need to be the one who does it, but I can just take part in that joy by helping you do it. We should never, too, lose this joy of, you know, the, um, how can I be so favoured that my Lord should come to me? This joy of what it means that God comes to us. As the Lord came to Elizabeth in, through Mary, God comes to us in our everyday life, both in his direct presence with us through his presence with us through his Holy Spirit, and also in the means of grace, the means of the Spirit, word and sacrament, through the encouragement of other people. God is with us. We ought never to lose our joy in the fact that God, who deigns in all his majesty to come to us in our lives. For a long time now, I've been caught by the phrase, I love the word condescension. And of course, it's an unusual, here I can see, it. it's an unusual word to love, isn't it? But I, I read it in an old theological book, and it, it used the phrase, the condescension of God. And when I read it, it kind of slapped me in the face, and I thought to myself, hey, wait, here, God is not snooty and patronising towards us, he's not condescending. But of course, that's not what it meant. What well, the original meaning of the word, you know, the word con means with, and dissension meaning he comes down. God comes down to be with us. It's condescension strangely has changed, <laughs> changed its meaning. So to be now precisely when I condescend towards somebody, it means I don't come down to be with them, but I hold myself above them. But actually the word itself originally meant, and theologically meant, the condescension of God is the fact that God abandons all that to come and to be with us, to share our destiny, to share our life, to be exactly on our level. The almighty and awesome creator of the universe, the one who is the sovereign Lord of all, comes from his throne to enter into the stickiness, into the mess, into the joys and the sorrows of our lives. And that ought to create in us exactly that same kind of puzzled and <laughs> joyful wonderment that Elizabeth felt. Why are we so favoured that our Lord should come to us? It's not something we can explain, but it is something that we can rejoice in. And finally, Elizabeth declares the, the blessing on Mary. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. And again, just the, the Holy Spirit has tenderly cared for us here, because he doesn't just say through Elizabeth, how blessed are you? you know, how blessed is Mary? But how blessed is she who believes that God would fulfil his promises? And it's said that way so that we too can read ourselves into that story. So that we can understand and appropriate it for ourselves. That we too are blessed when we believe that God will fulfil his promise. We too can have that deep joy. And so we ought to encourage each other to believe and to hold on to what God has said. No matter how hard we now, how much harder we make our lives when we go about doubting God, when we doubt his goodness towards us. Because you see, when we do that, when we don't believe that God will fulfil his promise, God will still fulfil his promise, but we don't have the joy of it. We lose the sweetness of it. As the old hymn says, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Jesus is for us, but we lose the joy of it when we don't trust him. And trusting in him will also mean obeying and submitting to him. Mary's final word to the angel was, uh, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your, uh, to your word. Mary showed that she trusted God by accepting what God wanted to do with her life. And now Elizabeth affirms that in her. And says that she's blessed in this act of trusting and, and putting her life on the line because of this trust that she has in God. She is now blessed and happy. And Elizabeth affirms it in her. And we can do that with each other as well. We ought to be affirming each other and say, you are right to trust in God. You are blessed because of that. 
Now, it's important to note, too, that what Mary and Elizabeth are rejoicing in is not simply their own exaltation, the fact that they've been given a, a special place or they've been somehow blessed in a, in a way that sort of just gives them good stuff. But what they're rejoicing in is the fact that they have been blessed and it is good for them, but that they are a part of God's plan and purpose. Their incredible joy comes from the fact that God is active in them and that they get to play a part in his plan of salvation. Likewise, we can rejoice that God makes us part of his plan. God is indeed active in the world and he is active through us. Part of our purpose here in the Christian community is to remind ourselves of this, to encourage each other, to embrace the roles that God has called us to, to celebrate that we are part of God's plan for the renewal of the world. We're not just recipients of God's blessing, but we actually have the extra blessing of being the people to pass it on to others. And I wonder if we might find more joy in our prayers if sometimes our prayers ask less for just, you know, sort of more good stuff for me, but our prayers ask more that God would use us for his purpose. And if we praised God for the fact that actually he does want to do that, and he is doing that. At the end of our passage, Mary then speaks out what we now know as the Magnificent. She praises God for coming to her and making her part of his plan. But what God has done in her life she sees reflected in what God does in all the world. We are invited to make this song also our song. Mary ties in all that's happening to her to the great story of what God was doing in the world through his people Israel and what God has promised to do through his Messiah. And so the first half of the Magnificent really is focused on Mary and the second half about God's general work in the world. The second half of the Magnificent is clearly a declaration of what God is doing in the new baby. I mean, that's the whole context of what this is all about. But it's phrased in the past tense and it talks about a sort of more general description of what God always does. And even, I think, prophetically, what she's saying is that this is what will happen through the Messiah. Interestingly, it's in the past tense. And one of the reasons for that is that it's called a prophetic uh, present, a uh, prophetic past. So we... So certain are the promises of God. And the prophets do this all the time. They talk about the, the things that God is about to do as if God had already done them. Because God's promises are so sure that from the moment he's made them, you can then celebrate the end result because there's no doubt that it's going to happen. And so the Magnificent takes up that tense. It talks about who God is and therefore who, how God is with all of us and what his end result will be. That's why it's blessed to believe that God will fulfil what he promises, because he will. Magnificent looks forward to the fulfilment of God's promise, and that is, it looks forward and points us to Jesus. The funny thing about this whole story is that, really, it's, it seems on the surface of it like it's a story about two women, and it is. I mean, deeply, this is their story, and yet there are other characters in the scene. After all, we've got John the Baptist there, in the body of Elizabeth is John the Baptist, and here he appears for the first time and begins his work. And Elizabeth also performs the first acclamation of Jesus as Lord, as she refers to Mary as the mother of my Lord for the very first time. I mean, in some ways in the story we don't know yet. The angel has said that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will have a child, but we don't know yet whether Mary is pregnant until the moment that she walks through the door and Elizabeth recognises her now as the mother of the Lord. And in a sense, she names for the first time Jesus in Mary's womb and names him as Lord. In the end here, everything that happens in this story, in the story of these women, and everything that happens in our lives ultimately is the story of Jesus and his goodness to us. And that's why our story speaks so well today. We are in the same situation. Our Lord does come to us. We are blessed when we know that God will be faithful. We are given to each other, like Mary and Elizabeth, to help us see God's work in each other, to celebrate it, 
and to remind each other of God's work for us in Jesus. Elizabeth and Mary looked forward to the births that were to come and they knew the joy of God's final salvation. Today, as we look forward to the celebration of Christmas, we also look forward to our celebration and to God's final salvation, which, because of Christmas, we know is coming. And so as we gather here today, we remind each other, blessed are those who believe that what God has promised, he will fulfil. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.